Hello all. Welcome to Newcastle upon Tyne Unitarians. As an opening, as we've started doing recently, let's explore the values that hold us together as a community. This is not a declaration of beliefs, but some of the values that we have in common. We welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition and deeper than any one set of opinions. With a respect for our Christian origins, we seek to explore all truths from all sources. Our fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. Welcome to you all this morning. Today's service is a discover and discuss service, and today's subject is spirituality without God. But let's first light our chalice. Feel free to join in if you do have one, and I do hope I can light this today. The lighter died this morning. May you feel welcome here. May you find peace. Here. May you find new ways of thinking here. May you find friendship here. Welcome back, everybody. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or feelings that they'd like to share in response? David, go ahead. Uh, just to say that um, uh, I've read a great book on a similar subject um, called The Book of Atheist Spirituality by a guy called Andre Comte Sponville. Strange name. Um, but in it, he explains um, his own uh, experiences of this transcendence and uh, the experiences of many other people throughout history who have experienced this without um, without being connected to religion in any way. But I'll, I'll come back to, to that later and, uh, and, and and talk about the experiences. Thank you, David. Anybody else? I think... I don't know. I'm not sure how directly this relates, but I think part of the question of the last century has been to try and find a way to have spirituality without God after so many people left the churches. And I'm not sure our society has really come up with any answers to that. Instead, we seem to forget that people have a spiritual dimension to their lives. And I think it leaves people very unprepared when something big happens, like the death of a loved one or a major change in life. I suppose... I don't know. I suppose it's trickier for me because obviously I do believe in God. So it's but it's asking questions that helps you see the edges and blurred areas of your own faith. Thank you, Louise. Anybody else? I do like I... of wind in the willows, I have to say. It's interesting. I mean, I've, when I was in Fintorn community a few years back, uh, not someone I met directly, but some years back, there's a sacred place in them there called Randall's Leap, which is where some of the founders of Fintorn would go to walk. One of them described an encounter uh, that was quite similar to the one uh, described by in Wind in the Willows. Uh, I'm, mm-hmm. uncertain, I'm uncertain why a, an image like Pan keeps appearing to human beings, but it's, there certainly seems to be something there. Uh, personally, I think Pan is probably a sort of personification um, of nature, really. Um, it's, it's one way in which we personify nature and helps us relate to it in a way because it has a partly, Pan has a partly human form and a lot of nature doesn't, which could make it more difficult for us as human beings to relate to. So I, that's the way I view Pan as a sort of bridge, bridging character. It's interesting because he's so similar to Sinonis and Hearn the Hunter, who were the male hunting and fertility gods in the pagan faith. Oh, yeah, definitely influenced from those, yes. Joe, go ahead. Joe, you're muted. Yeah, I'm not that. I was just going to say (laughs) that what we all begin by, I was just going to say. Anyway, I was going to say just that, of course, Pan, the name of Pan, is the root of the word panic. And interesting enough, in the bit that was read out there, he actually used the word panic in the preceding you know, paragraph. Like, ah. There was no sense of panic, which is fear at the presence of pan or the supernatural. That's it. Thank you, Joe. That's fascinating. Um, I, I, I do love that passage. Um, and I love the description that, uh, that Rat gives of being both afraid and unafraid at the same time. 
fascinating. Yes, it's something that comes up in quite a few literatures. I think in literature around Arthur and the Grail quest. Um, and I think also it, also in biblical writing, I suppose it depends. With all of this, I suppose you get to the question, are you talking about spirituality without God? Or are you talking about spirituality without ideas of God that we have had so far? If people are experiencing transcendent, transcendence, is that close to the experience of God that religious people have sought, but without some of the religious language? Because I think there's a passage in the Bible, and I forget which book, where one of the prophets, Moses, I think, is told he will see only the back of God. Because if you look on the face of God, you can't be a human being anymore. It will, it, in a sense, your being merges with God. And I think that's also part of the Grail quest. I think when Gawain or Galahad lifts the Grail and drinks it, he essentially dies and becomes one with God because you can't know that level of ultimate truth and retain your human identity. Thank you, Louise. Has anybody else got any thoughts in response to that so far? Right. There we are. Does anyone have any responses to the second half? Wave if you want to speak and then unmute yourself. Um, I, I found, oh, sorry, Jean, uh, Louise. It's interesting. I find, yeah, there's probably a lot in there for Unitarians because so much of what our faith should be at its best is about exploring that spiritual path. Uh, it's something. It's, occasion, it's a discussion I occasionally have with people uh, who think Unitarianism is a pick and mix faith where you can pick bits you like. And I say, well, that's doing it wrong because it's not about believing what you want to believe. It, it's not so much about believing what you think you would like to believe in. It's about believing what you know you should believe in, and that's a very hard and lonely path to walk sometimes. Thank you, Louise. Joe. I think ever since the, the Christian church came up with the idea that Christ is the word, the church has been hooked on words. And that's why you get statements of belief. But as John Rutter just made clear, you can express belief without words in creative activity, for example, by his composition of music. I think he is actually expressing a belief there and possibly also a belief in God. And I think you can do that in all sorts of artistic and creative ways without getting too worried about words and precise meanings. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I think art and creativity, um, getting in touch with those parts of ourselves that are not linguistic, are very important, and it is very easy to get bogged down in language we language has shaped our evolution massively um, and the the various languages across the world shape how we behave with each other and behave um, in daily life in ways that are so unconscious because you're steeped in your native language um, to such an extent that I think you don't you don't even realize how much language affects us thank you Jen anyone else Louise? Yeah. Picking up on that language issue, a little off the topic of that, but I have an interest in accident analysis because of my hobby as a diver. And there's been some fascinating research done recently on trying to understand how accidents happen and what causes them. One thing people have found is that a part of the issue in the Western world is that one of our dominant languages is English. And English tends to require subject deal. So our construction would tend to be she did not monitor her air properly, whereas in other languages, the construction is the air was not monitored properly. We tend to prefer the one, others tend to prefer the other, and you don't realise that until someone points it out. Yeah, it's interesting listening in the programme as a second point, um, the idea of Jesus as saviour or as not, because it's, of course, very fundamental to our Unitarian faith that Jesus is not the saviour. He's a human being like the rest of us. And I can, under, I can relate to the poet who wanted the old idea of God. 
I don't know. I personally have to reject that. I don't think that simply believing in something comforting is going to rescue me or save me. I think it's up to me to do that for myself. Thank you, Louise. Joe. Just to pick up on that, but Jesus doesn't save you. He tells you how to save yourself. I mean, there are human saviors. There are, for example, you know, people who go out when the seas are stormy and sort of rescue people. I mean, there are very, very obvious in which human beings rescue other human beings. But what Jesus came to do, I think, basically, was to show how to be the sort of human being that can embrace eternity. And to do that, you actually have to change yourself. You have to change the way you think and relate to other people. And that means rejecting large parts of yourself, probably which are there because of evolution. You know, the whole selfishness thing that makes us want to put ourselves first. You know, even when we do it in the English way, after you, after you, but we really want to be in charge and in control. And Jesus is really teaching, actually, the way to succeed in this life is to give up control Mm. and to help other people to do the same thing. I would agree with you, but I'd say also that for many, not all, but many Christianitarian Christian churches, and I don't want to be too stereotypical here, but many would say, no, Jesus is your saviour, he is God. You, If you do not believe, you are not saved. And it also comes with a nice side order of, and here are some people you can judge because they haven't done that yet. Yes. A few things appeal to human beings more than that, sadly. Yeah. I agree with your understanding, but I've encountered a lot of churches that wouldn't share it, which is a shame. Mm. I think when the church is most honest, though, it sees itself as a family of sinners. But if people who actually know that they've got to make some radical changes in their lives, if they're going to be good people. And when they depart from that, you're quite right. And they become dogmatic about particular ways of behavior or particular ways of thinking. Uh, then I think they lose the Christ spirit. I'd agree with that. I read a book once um, in which uh, a young man went to he went to interview. Um, he oh I don't know he he went to a monastery and there was a young monk there who was um, he was behaving very dogmatically and went off in a huff. And uh, this young man decided to speak to um, whoever was in charge. And uh, the response he got was, "Oh yes, we know that 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 monk." He's too full of religion to see God. Mm. And the idea being, of course, yeah. that he was too full of the bells and smells, if you like, the trappings, that the words, the the things that he was, he felt he was expected to do and follow, to feel the spirituality, the awe, the connection with the divine. And I think it is very easy. I think the second half of the program spoke a lot to our human need for certainty, um, and. We like having a sense of security and knowing this is how it is. It makes us feel safe. And in actual fact, part of the key to becoming mature in life, I think, is is being okay with uncertainty. Um, And many religions speak to our need for that certainty. And perhaps that's not always what we we need at heart. Perhaps sometimes what we need is to learn to be okay with the uncertainties of life, broader pictures the complexities and paradoxes that just happen in life. Does anyone have anything else they would like to say? Well, I was just going to say, I think that's correct. And I think actually your your faith and the way you practice it and perceive it does change through life. You know, experience does change you. I mean, for example, I'm more attached to the Book of Common Prayer 1662 now than I would have been 30 years ago. But now I kind of take get a different sense an awful lot of things are now for me allegorical or metaphorical but they're beautiful and i do think god is in beauty i do think if there's no beauty there if there's ugliness this is something which repels you there's an absence of god there and so i like thomas cranmer and what he did with the english language and for me the book of press 1662 is a fast track into being in contact with what I think of as God. The way that an awful lot of modern translations have become committee speech and this, that and the other. Uh, 
also the fact that just the fact that so many people have said the same words over and over. And when you're young, you think, oh, what a bore, what a drag. Let's have something new and not and get rid of it. Later on, you think, well, you haven't come up with anything better. So why do we go back to what was good and good enough for people for hundreds of years? Um, but yes, you do change, I think, over the years. And um, I think an awful lot of people in the mainline churches say things, but what they mean is quite subjective. But they come together for the liturgy, and that has its own value. Although it's interesting you say that, Joe, in a Unitarian gathering, since it was the existence of the Book of Common Prayer that led to our founding in the first place, because we wouldn't say it. Yeah, but then you produced your own. <laughs> in what <laughs> way? A, an expurgated version. I've, I've got a copy of um, a Unitarian prayer book of 1824. It's a, a modern repro, you know, and uh, they simply excised all the, the Trinitarian bits, but they actually kept the crown and they kept Interesting. the lot of what was that? And I, and I agree, Cranmer's words are brilliant, but I don't know that any Unitarian was ever made to use it or that there was an expectation you would use it. It was there as an option. Mm. Well, I, I think it was more or less a standard liturgy, you know, when they first got going as a separate um, uh, denomination in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. They actually had liturgical forms. And you you still find that. Now, where is it? King's Chapel, Boston, for example. They yes. still use the Book of Common Prayer, but they use a Unitarian form. Mm -hmm. uh, Not choice, but then that's perhaps my prejudice is showing through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. Anyway, there we are. Oh, it is. I admire the beauty of the language, but I won't be made to make, say words by anybody. <laughs> right. Thank you all for all your responses. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, and for discussing our thoughts. I'll extinguish our chalice with some final words. Let us be open to many truths, to many perspectives. Let us see the divinity in all, including in ourselves, and let us find purpose and feel the awe of transcendence. Thank you all.